best of Not So PG. I'm Brooke Blunt, my pronouns are she and her. I'm Maddie Mills, my pronouns are he and him. And before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge the custodians of the land on which we record. For me, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And for me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. All right. Well, being proud First Nations people, we know all too well that we are often judged because of the colour of our skin. But should you see colour? So let's talk about this and a whole lot more in this episode. Hope you enjoy. I got to spend some time with my dad in the car, you know, and have good combo on our way out to Colorado, Bra, which is where my dad grew up. And so I took the opportunity just to ask lots of questions about like him growing up on the mission and what that was like and just sort of rejogging my memory of the landscape of like where the mission was and where they moved to. But it was so beautiful to see my dad talk about his younger memories and like even though he had like a hard upbringing, it was really tough. There were some moments where like they, they were just so beautiful like just the 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 visual of them playing on the river all the time and like that was their fun like just literally fishing and playing on the river for hours on mm. end every day and living in this town where there's so many good memories that they hold for this place even though it was you know a racist little town but yeah, yeah. It, it was it was beautiful to be back there we didn't get to stay for long we literally were in and out but collie is such a place that feels like home even though i didn't grow up there yeah. No, I feel like that with other places that we used to spend a lot of time in, like Port Hedland, which is like north of WA, mm-hmm. definitely feel... That's so nice. I feel yeah. like listening to those stories, you just want to be able to like, I don't know, stick them in a capsule and just yes. like keep them away. Like, you know, when my nan used to tell me stories all the time, I've tried to remember them like as much as I can, but it's not the same. Like, no. I feel like when they, these mob tell you stories... Yeah, it's just a different level. And I feel like I've always been a very good storyteller, like even yep. with gossip and, you know, <laughs> other Having things. Obviously, yarn. we're, we're well, I'd say we're pretty good. We have a fucking podcast, yeah. for fuck's sake. <laughs> 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 but I, uh, I I think like them older people like when you are able to tap into those younger memories of them and like g- and get them passionate about sharing like their younger lives I love seeing the reactions like I um I was just like we gave my cousin a lift from where the funeral was at Colorinabri back to Narrabri and this is my second cousin so this is my dad's first cousin and his name's Wingy because he um unfortunately um has lost um, all movement in one arm from polio. Um, and he, he's just one of the funniest blokes on the planet. And he was like, yeah, cuz, you, you, um, can you give me a lift back to Narrabri? And I was like, yeah, all right. We just have to do a little detour, you know, like blah, blah, blah. And then when he went inside to get his, he goes, oh, just, can you take me around here? I just need to get my swag and then I'll come with you, mob, eh? And I was like, yeah, okay. Yep. Drive around to this little house. This little house is no <laughs> bigger than like this. A taxi, eh? Yeah, no <laughs> bigger than this. He goes, ah, uh, and then next minute, it was like leaving, doing like the grand tour. Oh, Hank, you want to just drive me around to Pam's there? And um, I'll say bye to her. And literally, I was driving around Collie, like with this cousin <laughs> of mine, basically like the farewell tour. But we got on the road and just hearing him and dad chat about their life growing up, they spent so much time together as little, you know, little runarounds in Collie that hearing all those stories, it just filled my heart. Yeah. Especially how my yeah. dad was a big S-L-U-T, he was a runner muck. I mean, he does have 10 kids to five women. <laughs> but um, no, he, he was just hearing those stories of how my dad was like, you know, like the, you know, bit of a Casanova back in the day. And I'm like, I can tell because I've seen them photos. He was a good looking rooster. Oh, dad. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a modern day so- sort of story? Like I watched um, Anne Juliet recently mm. and you know how it's like Anne Juliet takes power of her own... Um, story. Yeah. And I always think these blackfellas have like the perfect stories to have a play. Yes. Well, don't you reckon? It's like- so funny you say that because I told my dad on the way this is it's so weird that you brought this up. I spoke to my dad about this when I was driving out there and I said, "Dad, I said, look, I'm writing a play." And I said, "It's called it's all about you." And he was like, "What?" I was like, "Yeah." And then I ran him through the timeline of the play and he was like, Wow, he was like, that's so cool. Like, he was so shocked that I was writing a play. And then on our way back, him and Wingy yarning, I was like, I'm using all this information. I'm taking it, planning it in my head, and I'm going to use all this in the play. But, um, yeah, 100%. It's because their lives, it's so different now, you know. Like, Mm. their lives when they were younger, so interesting. And just for them, just to see them survive in a way that, like, how did you get through those some of those moments, you know? Yeah, 
Yeah. Like, it was hard for old black followers back in the day. Like, Yeah, racism, right? Mm-hmm. It was just so prominent and it still, I mean, it still exists. Like, I feel yeah. like we don't escape it. Um, well, yeah, it's still... And there's been it- some recent news you know that Stan Grant Mm -hmm. and sort of came out that he quit Mm Q&A because he was facing racial discrimination and had been for many years which we didn't know about and he kept very much so private and on the down low. Sometimes you're in environments especially in the media you'll know about this and it's like sometimes you feel like if you say something or speak out you're, you're actually biting the hand that feeds you. And so there, yes. there's a bit of like a battle of the mind when it comes to how do I approach this? Because if I start speaking out against the people who are my employers, I won't have a job and I and, and that could be an issue for some people, you know. So I think that he was maybe trying to protect himself and his own reputation in a way, but also... I'm so proud of, like, this man for taking this stance because he's such an icon in the industry that we look up to when it comes to media. He's, like, probably at the helm of First Nations media and has been for a long time. And I think that for him to take this stance is actually setting a really good example of boundaries. No, Truly, you're, yeah. You're crossing these. You've crossed them for a while now, and I'm and I'm out. And it's, like, self-preservation. Yes. And, I, and that I completely agree with, like, you know, that fear of biting the hand that feeds you. Yeah. Why do we have to put up with that and that have that live with that fear of losing our jobs and still face then those racial slurs? Like it's yeah. just there's some things that you know when I was working for different companies that I just dealt with because you just think well otherwise I don't want to lose my job like I need you know money and I need yes. to support myself but yep. it, yeah it's just such a conflict isn't it now I it think is. my relationship with Stan Grant has always been so from a place of respect and I think this is just on a whole nother level like I think he speaks so eloquently mm-hmm. um, I remember him writing this speech years ago Ooh, yeah, about I know racism exactly which one you're talking about and it was it was honestly like a global movement and it sort of brought awareness to the Australian dream. Mm-hmm. That's what it was called. Yep. The Australian dream, so-called Australia. It sort of spoke to the, the racism in AFL, yeah. to Adam Goods and, you know, how we deal with that as a nation. And that was years ago, right? Mm-hmm. That was like maybe 2017, 18, something around that time, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Why... Is it still happening? Yeah. How much do we have to tolerate? We shouldn't have to tolerate any racism. And that's, and that's the reason why we speak about it. Because no matter how much the dial is shifting, if it's not shifting to the point where we don't see it, we continue to talk about it. It's like people yeah. might say, oh, it's getting better. There might be things that are changing. Well, the fact that the, the that a very staunch First Nations man has to leave his job and organisation because of racism shows that it absolutely isn't isn't changing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. and he's a strong fella. Like, he's someone who has obviously, you know, he has a very big First Nations respected family. He, mm-hmm. you know, comes from, um, he's a Wiradjuri man with incredible ties to um, strong, staunch cultural men and women. And I yeah. think that Stan isn't someone to back down easily, to walk no. away easily. It's obviously taken the, its toll on him over a long period of time. And I think that even though we might have this idea that like things are shifting and things are moving forward we cannot stop the fight because as soon as we become less you know vigilant with this stuff it rears its head again yeah no matter how safe we feel in our in our bubbles sometimes of safe spaces i'm going to continue to talk about it and i'm going to continue to raise awareness of it because it's like at the end of the day, there are people out there who are experiencing this on the daily. Exactly. Ignorance is kind of like, well, this issue doesn't affect me, so therefore it doesn't matter to me. That's right. Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. But the thing is, people need to mad like need to understand like race matters. I hate those people that are like, oh, I don't see colour. Well, you should. Because that's because the colour issue. exists and the thing is, like We've been, it's like if colour didn't exist and you didn't see colour, we wouldn't have experienced all this oppression. Yeah. Like we wouldn't have, like you wouldn't have colonised, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it just like race absolutely matters. Yep. And I think people need to wake up and understand that. Yeah. And then, you know, then when as, as soon as more people realise that this is a like a global issue. Absolutely. Then 
I think and it's people going, will wake up. Like, yeah. It's been happening for generations and generations, hundreds, even thousands of years. You know what I mean? Like, racism isn't something that's brand new. And yeah. um, it, this is a weird segue, but to be able to, to, to sort of... Um, like understand the historical context as well, not just in this country but abroad, I was able to see um, Tina the Musical and all my life, like that story in itself, like it is a race story. It is a story of mm-hmm. triumph. It is a story of, um, you know, the, the 60s, 70s, 80s in America and how black women were treated and how black yeah. men were treated um, and just seeing like this powerhouse black woman on stage play Tina the Musical, my everything about it felt so uh, electrifying for me. Like I was like a proud black man, like watching this black woman thrive and like do this incredible job at playing Tina. But then also Tina's story in itself, like she had to overcome so much. And like it took years, it took 40 years for her to become a superstar. Like, she didn't become a massive star Thing until her, uh, yeah, in, yeah. in her 40s. Yeah. It's like black people are the most resilient people on the planet. And it's like we need to be able to have days where we don't have to be. Yeah, where we can just exist and take up space where we belong and yeah. we shouldn't have to fight, at, like, 40 years to be superstars. Like, yeah. we, that, obviously she was a phenomenal um, musician Ooh, and yeah. singer. So why was she not noticed? Not to say that her race was the thing that held her back, but I think that would probably be that thing that contributed to totally. her not being picked Especially up. Especially during what I mean? that time. Like sooner. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So okay. I'm obviously 365 days gay. Yes. Which I call 365 gay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were talking about this on a recent panel when I was in Cairns um, about, you know, branding and you know talking about how brands can be more inclusive without being sort of like tokenistic or coming across as just being like selective like yes. you know how do you do how do you be more aware of inclusivity and diversity without being just you know you can sniff the tokenism or you can sniff when someone's not being genuine or authentic, totally. you know, like a brand or yep. um, a business or, you know, just in people as well. Like yes. that want to be like, hey, um, uh, I know that you support LGBTQI rights, but we were wondering if we could just get um, you to talk on a panel for like 30 minutes about how gay you are, <laughs> um, you know, and... My biggest, you know, I actually was talking to a good friend of mine about how I'm in sort of a, you know, what from from the outside looks like a very heteronormative relationship because I am, you know, in a relationship with a guy. Yes. But how important my season of The Bachelor was important for bisexual bisexuality and pansexuality. Yeah. Um, and that visibility is really important. So regardless if I'm in a straight relationship, like, you know, we still need to see these things and, and show these things. Yeah. And I'm still bi, like, you know, I'm still pansexual. I'm yeah. not one to continuously label myself, but I am in a straight passing relationship. Yes. But um but how important representation is and I mean Pride Month is the the best you know, way to be able to express that, but didn't come from, you know, it came from a lot of sacrifice, a lot of protesting, a lot of fighting, also yes. a lot of dying. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, obviously, we know that um, queer people, you know, were more prone to um, being discriminated against and also, I guess, hit with um, HIV as well. Yes. Um, I just I think it's such a crazy world that we live in now that we get to live so free like free to express ourselves and be you know ourselves we're in a time you know years ago that it wasn't so accepted. Um, yeah. I definitely think that like I agree with you but I also just saw something on the um TV recently which was um that in Uganda um if you are caught having sex um uh, in a gay relationship or having sex that you could be um given the death penalty. And for me, it's like, this is why pride is actually so important. And sometimes there's the counter argument to pride as to why do you need pride? You guys can have all the same rights as us. Yeah, maybe in this country, but not in every other country around the world. There's still so much discrimination. There's literally laws that prohibit people to have a gay relationship or a queer relationship. And if they do it, they get 
their, their, their sentence is death. Like, that is just crazy to me. So I feel like um, Pride Month is super important um, to be able to um, spread awareness of things like um, like that. But also it's a time for us to also just, you know, have fun and, and um, express ourselves. Um, and that's what I'm going to do here in LA. Yeah. I'm wearing Live my Live our life, authentic like, lives. Yeah. Yes. Live our authentic lives. Um I know that, you know, there's these laws and legislation that still exists that definitely fully discriminates and um, is horrible to yeah. queer people, especially in different countries. Like, the death penalty. Like, we just... Like, it's just insane. Like, yeah. it's just insane. It's crazy to think, like, I was on a panel talking about marriage um, law and the amendment um, in 2017, obviously, that gender, you know, there was no discrimination against who could get marriage through gender or race, and that was changed only in 2017. Mm. So that was not too long ago. So that's, like, what, six years ago. Um, before then, you couldn't get married. And it's crazy. Um we were, you know, like, why, why do these, why is not it happened sooner in some ways? But then also like now it's so crazy. I get the chance to marry five couples through a campaign that I'm doing with Tinder. Yeah. Wow. And like, it's such a full circle thing for me. Cause when I got my like tattoo, when that amendment happened, I'm calling it an amendment, but it's a bill passed, wasn't it? It was yep. like a, it was called something, but I can't remember the legal term. Um, yeah, it was a bit. So it's yeah. crazy to think that, you know, for six years I've had this tattoo to remind myself when that was achieved and then in this moment I get to to marry, like, or to, to be a part of five queer couples that have met on Tinder. That's amazing. And that are, like, you know, get, yeah, walking down the aisle or, you know, getting, I love that. moving into that next step of... Um, their lives like it's just crazy and and, I mean I want that for everyone like I want that freedom for everyone and it just sucks that in other countries that we don't yeah accept that and also sometimes you get um companies jumping on the back of pride month um in a really tokenistic way and sometimes their um campaigns don't seem that genuine oh yes absolutely I've seen it happen to other people I've had you know, and I've been a part of it myself. I'm easy now. I think because I've worked in this industry for a while, I can sniff it out. Yeah. I mean, I know when Channel 10 was setting me up to be the Bachelorette with all the big headlines like Brooks Big Bombshell and and Brooks Big Secret, and it was like <laughs> in my own community, my bisexuality or my pansexuality wasn't really a secret. Like yes. everyone's like Brooke is gay, like. Yep. And she's happy just being Brooke. Like, she doesn't need a label. And everyone was like, we don't care. Like, but yeah. to networks and to, you know, production, um, to the media landscape, they're just, it's just so foreign to them. So they, yep. you know, want to make a big headline about it. And that was really, like, disappointing at points because it's like, well, it's not so unnecessary. But at the same time, it's so necessary for that representation to happen. Yeah. So if it's not happening now, like, when is it going to happen? Totally. And so that's what I, you know, I sort of have taken on was that if not me, who, and if not now, when? And yep. so... You've got to be a part of these movements and this momentum of, you know, showing that. But at the same time, it's just like why you feel like you're fighting a fight that you don't really necessarily. It's like you're aligned to it because you are queer and you're gay and you feel like you need to for your people and your community. But at the same time, you're like, oh, this is like so exhausting. And it's yeah. like, well, I don't want to be your like poster child. And the thing is, so many people like, you know, so many queer people we're all so diverse, mm-hmm. but I think the people that they show in these campaigns and, you know, in um, these, you know, like on TV, like I, I even, you know, I'm guilty of it as well. Like I, I feel like they're very 2D, you yeah. know, 
Like we're so diverse mm-hmm. and everyone in the queer community is so different and you can't, one person can't speak for a whole community or a whole um, array of people. So I feel like for me I've always been really guilty of that because I'm like, well, I can't speak on behalf of everyone. Yeah. I can only speak on my own experiences. Totally. And what my queer experience has been like is a total privilege because I feel like I went into a, a community like the football community and it was yep. accepted to be gay. Because yes. everyone was gay, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. But in other areas, it's not. Like, even in my own community, being queer was not really that accepted or wasn't really known. But yeah. then when I moved to Perth and I, you know, went into communities like the football world, everyone was like, well, yeah, like, this is just known. Like, we, yeah. all, we don't care. And, and that was really good for my identity and, and in my queer identity because... I just felt, like, accepted to yeah. be who I was and yes. that's what I want other people to do. Totally. But, yeah, with, like, people who, you know, <sighs> organisations and businesses, which I talk to quite a bit, you can sniff it out when it's not genuine. You, yeah. can, you can sniff it out in that first email or that first interaction that yeah. have they done their research, you know, what is their experience with their inclusivity? Like, what is their history of inclusivity and diversity? Have they had many queer representatives or people um, of colour? Like, you know, you do the research, you do the due diligence because it's just like buying a house. Yeah. You know, you do all the necessary things to set that up to then make that deal. You should be doing the same thing with business and yes. especially with something like, you know, where they're gaining from your knowledge and your power and your identity. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, well, you need to go do the work and you need to also do the research and you need to feel valued and appreciated. You don't want to just be ticking a box for people. Totally. Yeah. No, I, I 100% agree with you. I think um, I've seen it happen across, I saw it happen across Sydney World Pride, but it's also like I was actually hosting a panel discussion based on this this conversation and um, there's, I think, that when they interact at that high level of like a sponsorship or, or like a big partnership with like either Pride or Mardi Gras, they're actually, these days, there needs to be um, like tangible things within the charter that um, show that they are supporting the community throughout their whole year instead of just at this one moment. So, um, I think that there's like things that are happening in terms of um, like – weeding out the bad ones um, mm. and making sure that the people who are aligning with the with the queer community have um, their values aligned with our with our um, with our community and our people all right that's all we have time for today thank you guys so much for listening to not so PG if you'd love us leave a five star rating and a little review and if you want to tell us something follow us on socials and slide into the DMs Brooke's handle is at brooke.blurton. Mine is at it's Maddie Mills. And you can follow all the Nova Podcast action over at Nova Podcast Official. All right, lovely ones. Bye. Bye.